Growing up, whenever I'd boot up my Wii, I never thought to question how I had access to such a wide library of games. From SNES to GameCube to N64, I pretty much had it all. Obviously, I knew my dad had done a bit of tinkering with the console, but what he had to do to modify the console was something my tiny little brain couldn't comprehend as a kid. More importantly, I had no idea that his methods of obtaining these games were extremely shady and potentially crossing the border of illegal. When you think of piracy, I'm sure the first thing that comes to your mind is, how long will my prison sentence be? And before anyone asks, no, my dad did not go to jail and our house did not get raided by a Nintendo SWAT team. But when you actually think of piracy, a lot of questions come to mind. Is it ethical to pirate games? Is it safe? Why should I pirate games? Why shouldn't I? In this video, I am going to be covering all of these questions, give a bit of background on Nintendo's history with piracy, and hopefully provide you with some information that gives you some insight on what piracy is and how it affected Nintendo for years. As a quick disclaimer, I'll be going over a variety of different topics, so if there's something in particular you want to learn about, all the timestamps will be in the description as well as the pinned comment. Now, let's get into it. For those of you who live under a rock or clicked on the video with no knowledge on the topic whatsoever, let me tell you what piracy is. Piracy is defined as the unauthorized use of another's production, invention, or conception, especially in the infringement of a copyright. For example, you playing a copy of Super Mario Odyssey that you purchased, whether it be a physical or digital copy, is under the authorized access of Nintendo. Because you legally purchased it, you are safe to do pretty much whatever you want with it. Stream it, share it, sell it, anything's on the table since it's an authorized issue of a Nintendo product. Now, let's say your parents didn't get you that copy of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe that you wanted for your birthday, and instead got you Nickelodeon Kart Racers. So what do you do? You do what any other desperate kid would do and go download a ROM off the internet and play it with an emulator. Problem solved, life is good, you have your game, and although you didn't really obtain it by any legal means, you have no way of getting in trouble for it. Of course, until your neighbor little Jimmy comes over and uses the emulator and says, Man, I wish I could play this on my computer with an emulator. Hey, can you send me a zip file of this? Once you start distributing these files, that's where you start entering dangerous territory, because not only are you using an unauthorized issue of Nintendo's product, but you are also distributing it, which could only get you in even further trouble. The term emulate means to reproduce the function or action of a different computer, software system, etc. The basic definition for the term emulator coins as hardware or software that permits programs written for one computer to be run on another computer. In simpler terms, an emulator is any sort of software that mimics how a different piece of technology works, whether it be a console or computer. For instance, let's say you wanted to play Tomodachi Life straight from your PC. You're able to do that with the power of an emulator. In this case, you could use an emulator like Citra. What Citra will do is it will take a ROM file you uploaded and run it through the program to allow you to play it. Because Citra was built to mimic a 3DS, it will allow you to emulate any 3DS game and allow you to play it just like you would on a normal 3DS, so long as you have a ROM running through the program. Citra is not the only example. There are thousands of different emulators for different consoles, like the Dolphin emulator, which works just like a Wii, Yuzu for Nintendo Switch, and the list goes on, but you get the idea. Some emulators require you to upload a ROM in order for you to play. Others, though, require you to have a legally obtained copy of the game in order for you to use it. Many emulators, however, have been taken down or had legal action taken upon them. For example, the Dolphin vs. Nintendo case. In late May of 2023, Nintendo had filed a cease and desist order against the Dolphin emulator project being put on Steam. According to a Nintendo spokesperson, the reason for the DMCA was as follows. Nintendo is committed to protecting the hard work and creativity of video game engineers and developers. This emulator illegally circumvents Nintendo's protection measures and runs illegal copies of games. Using illegal emulators or illegal copies of games harms development and ultimately stifles innovation. Nintendo respects the intellectual property rights of other companies and, in turn, respects others to do the same. Basically, because the emulator requires ROMs in order for you to play it, it is considered illegal. And of course, since Steam is such a big platform, the creators of Dolphin will get a lot of attention by putting it up on Steam. This case had changed a lot of people's perspectives on the emulation community. Although some people see it as fair game, others find it completely unethical. That's not the case for all emulators, however. One very important thing I haven't talked about yet is reverse engineering. In January of 1999, Sony filed a lawsuit against Connectix complaining that their emulator called Virtual Game Station had been under trademark and copyright infringements of BIOS, the software program Sony used to operate the PlayStation. 
It was decided that Connectix had not violated any copyright or trademark infringements due to the fact that all of the code written for the VGS was not similar to BIOS in any way. This was because during the development of the VGS, the Connectix team had used the BIOS code only during the development of the VGS, meaning that the code that they had in the final version was completely original and completely legal. If you're confused by this, this is basically reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is the reproduction of another manufacturer's product following detailed examination of its construction or composition. In simpler terms, it's basically just rewriting existing code to be completely different from the original and making it your own, a totally legal process that makes it easy to avoid copyrights. Going back to the Connectix case, since the Connectix team had only used the BIOS of the PlayStation as a reference, they technically didn't break any copyright laws, therefore the VGS was under fair use, another win for piracy thanks to the American legal system. If you think about it, most of these fan-made emulators are actually better than licensed emulators, which yes, do exist, but who wants to pay $50 every year to play these games when you can just do the same thing on your PC for absolutely zero cost? Speaking of emulating, I never really explained what ROMs are. ROMs are read-only memory files, which is a computer file that holds a copy of the data from a read-only memory chip, which are often used in video game cartridges and computer firmware. In order to be able to play a game through an emulator, you'd need a ROM file of said game. In order to obtain a ROM file, you can either legally rip them yourself, if you own an authorized copy of the game, or illegally download them from some shady website online that will most definitely not give you a virus. Also worth noting, most ROMs have ROM hacks, which just adds custom content to your game, kind of like mods. ROMs can be run through emulators, or similarly, they can be used on other consoles that have backwards compatibility with older consoles like the 3DS. Since the 3DS has backwards compatibility with the DS, it is able to read and play any Nintendo DS game. If you were one of the lucky people who managed to homebrew your 3DS before Nintendo shut down the eShop, congrats! If you're one of the people who either didn't or doesn't know what homebrew is, let me explain that to you. Remember how earlier in the video I explained that I had any title imaginable from SNES to GameCube sitting right on my Wii channel? That's all possible with the power of homebrew. Homebrew refers to any kind of software produced by developers which intends to bring more content and or break the restrictions of a console. With Homebrew, you can play different fan-made applications, use applications that modify and expand the capabilities of your console, and much more. While some Homebrew users simply have it to enjoy the extra features it offers for their consoles, not all Homebrew users have good intentions, more specifically the pirates. While Homebrew is a great way to see how you can push your console to the limits, it also serves as a dangerous tool for those who are looking to get their hands on free games. Even though Homebrew can go hand in hand with pirating, it has done some pretty incredible things, like bringing back many online services that have been long shut down by Nintendo that many people still enjoy and use to this day. With programs like Reconnect24, community channels like the Check Me Out channel and the Everybody Votes channel were revived. As well, Games like Mario Kart Wii and Super Smash Bros. Brawl are able to have online servers running thanks to Wiimify, and with mod packs like CTGP Revolution, you can add tons of custom tracks, carts, and characters to Mario Kart Wii. Now that I've explained pretty much everything you need to know about piracy, we can answer some of the questions I brought up in the intro, starting off with, is it safe to pirate games? Piracy can be a very touchy subject for most, as many people automatically assume you're guaranteed to go to jail if you're caught doing it. I can assure you, Nintendo does not have a police force on speed dial ready to take you away when they find out you've been playing a pirated copy of LEGO Batman for the Wii. But what I can tell you is that there are some precautions you should take when deciding whether or not you'd want to. It's very obvious Nintendo is not the biggest fans of their own fans, and they will stop at nothing to ensure that their fans have no access to older titles without having to sell their grandmother's left kidney. A big reason why most people pirate games is because of scalpers online. It's almost impossible to try and get a physical copy of an older Nintendo title without having to practically sell your soul for it. At the time of recording this, copies of Mario Kart Wii that aren't on eBay can run upwards of up to $80. It's absolutely insane. Nintendo is also pretty scummy. It's not like they try to hide it either. If you want to pay $50 every year for an individual Nintendo Online subscription just to have access to older titles on your Switch, great. But if you want to pay a little more for a one-time purchase of a Wii U and turning it into a homebrew powerhouse, then good on you. Everyone has their preferences. What I'm trying to get at is if Nintendo doesn't want us to pirate their games, they should make it more accessible for us to try and get them legally at least. I would pay some serious cash if they released a collection of Wii games or GameCube games remastered for the Switch. I mean, just look at 3D All-Stars, it's basically an overpriced ROM hack. Although you have to consider that some remasters remove a lot of features found in the originals, which is another good point as to why it's probably better off to play the originals. Overall, the best reason to pirate games like these is for preservation purposes. 
If you're a sucker like me, you can pay thousands in cash to have a physical copy for collection purposes. But if you're smart, you can just emulate it on a console with backwards compatibility and you're pretty much set for life. When it comes to preserving video game history, Nintendo refuses to let their fans get a piece of any of it. Despite all this, there are some dangers to pirating games. For example, the number of viruses and malware you can accidentally download to your computer if you're not careful is endless. Lots of ROM sites nowadays are either extremely shady or extremely slow. Another issue you could run into is the possibility of getting banned from Nintendo's online services. If you're using an older modified console like the Wii or 3DS, it's very unlikely for it to happen. But if you decide to do this with a more recent console that's still getting updates like the Switch, your chances at getting your account banned from Nintendo Switch Online is more likely, so proceed with caution. One last thing I wanted to mention is saves. Whatever you do, always save. Back up, back up again, and then make a backup of your backup backup just to be safe. Make as many saves as possible to prevent your data from either being corrupted or lost. Things like these happen all the time with pirated versions, so be very careful. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Lily, isn't piracy wrong? Shouldn't you be encouraging us not to do this? And my response is, eh, I'm not your mother. You can decide whether or not you want to be responsible in terms of pirating something like an N64 game. While I have my opinions on piracy, I can only tell you that legally, it's not something that you should dive into. But looking at the moral side of the situation, take into consideration what I said earlier about how Nintendo feels about their fans and piracy generally, and you'll get an idea on what I think about it. I hope you've gathered some useful information from this. Links to all the sources I reference will be in the description below. Thank you for watching the video all the way through. If you enjoyed this and would like to see more commentary documentary type videos from me like this, leave a comment. As well, be sure to like and subscribe to see more content.